Hello, welcome to another episode of the DSL Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Cole, and today our guest is Aton Anzenberg. He is the chief data scientist at Bill.com. Uh, he also has a PhD in physics from Boston University, and you majored in astrophysics uh, at UC Santa Cruz in your undergrad. Uh, quite the, the the profile. Aton, welcome to the DSL Podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about um, uh, we're going to be talking about deep learning. So getting started with deep learning. So um, I know that's something that that you have um, brought to uh, to your current role at, at Bill.com, talking a little bit about that journey um, and you know helping others get started. Uh, you know maybe talk at high level like you know types of use cases, where to start, um, what to expect, all that good stuff. Um, the next thing that's cool. it's kind of you know. There are a lot of PhDs uh, who are DSLs who come onto the DSL podcast, uh, but not all PhDs are in uh, physics. <laughs> so uh, I'd love, you know, that's an unreal, I call that a somewhat unrelated field. So I'd love to hear, um, we'll talk a little bit about like, you know, what, what is translated, what hasn't translated um, from, sure. uh, from your PhD. And, and also like, yeah. is there sort of an untapped market in, in hiring uh, physics PhDs and, and bringing them into the world of data science? So it's possible. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not cheap. So uh, sure. It's always, it's always possible. Um, but yeah, so my journey yeah. has been somewhat unique. I, I found um, from data scientists, machine learning researchers that I've spoken to, um, generally, I, I see a lot of unique journeys, right? No, no, yeah. there's no like you know kind of one way to do things, which is really cool. Actually, what attracts me a lot to um, to this uh, space because we see a varied thought and and varied ways of tackling very challenging problems um, in in industry, right? Um, mm -hmm. Quite different uh, in terms of cha challenging problems in academia, right? So I came from the academic world. Um, a lot of stuff has translated though um, over. I would say um, pretty much any any math statistics that that we were dealing with, you know, when when I was taking data as a physicist, we're dealing with like small data sets, and when you have small data sets, statistics is super important. Now right. in machine learning, uh, we deal with huge data sets. Statistics is still actually incredibly important, but in different ways in terms of bias, but um, but but also just thinking about problems um, holistically, thinking about how to tackle challenging problems. Um, you know, in physics. The joke is like every cow is a sphere, right? It's like how do we break down to like the simplest, you know, simplest form of something and build them? Or, or actually, yeah, build a model. I mean, it's by by paper, right, by hand. But how do right. you build a model that tries to encompass like what you're seeing in the world, right? You're trying to model the world. In this case, like I mean, in deep learning, but machine learning in general, you're modeling data. And with data, you know, we uh, nowadays because of you know compute power, our data can be quite large. You know, you have video, you have audio, um, mm -hmm. um, pictures, you know, text, right? Like whole corpus of Wikipedia or Yelp or whatever you're dealing with. So we're dealing with big, big amounts of data, um, and you're trying to un you know get get understanding, try to get um, even just some insight from that data. Um, deep learning in these kind of domains is actually very powerful. It's not you know. It, it, it's a tool. I, I like to say, like you know, it's a tool that works really well on certain domains, and uh, and then in other domains, we still use you know classical machine learning like a random forest, XGBoost, you know, like GBM, even AutoML these days. Um, you know, <laughs> maybe yeah. that's one thing that's changed quite a bit. Is I, I'd be more uh, inclined to use AutoML, which I, I don't know if if your um, audience would be familiar with, but it's essentially. Um, you have data, you know, you have data. That's always like the beginning the, the first point. You trust your yes, data, yes. you want to model it, but you're not going to do the hyperparameter searching. You're not going to try to optimize the model. Um, you have an algorithm that tries to optimize what the model should look like. So like whether it's mm -hmm. an ensemble of like 10 different models of all these different hyperparameters and it's doing that through statistics, right? Um, it's doing it also because we have compute power. Uh, so AutoML, it, it just in my experience now, more recently, is very powerful. Whenever I think about maybe building a scikit model, I I'll also tend to try to do an AutoML model, right? Which will have an ensemble of a bunch of different models. Um, but deep learning, it's it's beyond AutoML because of the compute. It takes, you know, it, like for me, sometimes it takes a week to train one model. And, uh, and that's on one GPU and the GPU is already fairly expensive, right? Compared to CPU. And so you're not going to build a thousand of these and try to hyper parameter search. Also the parameter space is way, way large. Like it's, it's crazy big compared to like an XG boost model. Right. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, where to begin, where to begin with deep learning. Yeah. So let, let's <laughs> hold on. There, there, there's, let me slow you down. There's a lot of great okay. information that you're throwing at me here. 
Um, so one of the things I, I mean, you know, I heard you say, um, and I don't want to move on from it until we, we unpack it a little bit is, is, is that you've become more enamored with the power of sort of auto ML, right? So the ability to basically throw data at an auto ML, you know, package and, um, you know, have it come up with, with the model and sort of optimize for the, you know, for whatever variable you depend on variable you're trying to, you know, for, to predict or what have you, <coughs> hopefully the edit out the, that cough. <coughs> um, yeah, see, I told you I need water. Uh, um, at any rate, um, uh, and, and leveraging auto ML and as a way, are you saying that you're leveraging auto ML as a way of sort of comparing against sort of your traditional like scikit learn sort of model that you come up with on, on, on its own? Is that, is that kind of like, sure. it's almost like a benchmarking, uh, exercise. Yeah. yeah. And then how, absolutely. Yeah. And then how much are you trusting uh, an auto ML model. So are, you know, are you, um, trusting it no differently than you would say a model that your team, um, or you built using scikit-learn or, or no? Yeah, I, I would trust it, um, as equal if I consider this. So you have the same training data and you have the same, uh, validation data, a holdout mm -hmm. that you test at the very, very end, right? After you've done all your mixing and matching. And then within your training data, you know, you're going to split it, you know, a million ways, right? You do like your random split and that's where, that's how auto ML works, right? You're it's tuning hyperparameters, um, as a function of your test set performance, your test sets coming from the training data, but yep. it's every, every new iteration is a new slice of, of the train data. Right. Um, how do I, in terms of how I trust it at the end of the day, I trust it as well as I trust my data, you know, what the data is when, when I talk with, um, you know, my team or like when I talk with, um, uh, people that are building the models, I always start with, um, how do you trust the data? You know, mm. is it a whole list? Is it like the, the universe of what you're trying to model, right? And, and I mean it in that, that scale, right? Um, and that's, you know, I, I give talks as well about bias in, in machine learning or in AI. Um, bias is huge because if you, have, uh, if you have training data or data, that's a small subset of your universe and you build a model for it, your model is gonna work okay in that kind of local area of your universe. Sure. And when you try to expand it, I don't know if it's, you know, I, I start to lose trust. I start to become a skeptic. Um, mm. So so if, if I trust the data, of course, I'm going to trust the auto ML. It's just an algorithm. Like, you know, even a random forest is an ensemble of decision trees. It, in some, I mean, right. it's not auto right. ML, but it is an algorithm that's training a model. But that model is like, you know, a hundred little models inside. Of, you know what I mean? So, right, right, so ultimately, right. yeah, right. of course, I trust it. Um, but, but the data is, is always important, always important. And, um, I, I found successful, uh, data scientists or machine learning engineers, um, or researchers or whatever the names are these days, uh, yeah. the ones that are successful are the ones that really try to understand the data. They try to dig in, understand is, you know, what the use case is, how this is going to be used, what the data is that they're trying to model. Is it holistic? You know, is it the, 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 you know, kind of the, the volume of the universe they're interested in now. Right. So let me, let me stop you there. Yeah. Like I want to, un <laughs> like, so, so when you say is the data that they're working with, like sort of the universe that they're working with, are you basically saying like, Hey, uh, if, we're, if what we're trying to predict, like, I want to make sure I have all of the possible features, you know, all the possible data that is out there and that can be used at my disposal. Like if I'm missing something, it doesn't matter how great yeah. the model is. Um, it's probably not going to perform as well if I'm missing some key feature. So yeah. is yeah. part of, as your role as a DSL, I mean, is that something that you, like, how do you instill that, that mentality <laughs> in your data scientist to make sure that they're, 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 they know all of the data that they need to solve a particular problem? Do you have like a, a, a review stage before you dive into a project to make sure that they have all the data before they just, you know, just go diving off and creating their model? Like, what do you do to guard against yeah. that? Yeah. For, for critical stuff, um, it, it's like it's cr critical things in terms of bias that there's protected groups, you know, we're in the US. And I think in most of most of the world now, there's just protected groups. So if you're modeling as an example, you know, if you're modeling on an age range that is, I don't know, let's say 18 to 34, I'm not sure I'm going to trust the model outside of that age range, right? And so you, right. it, it, you, you can't really apply that. And it's not even, it doesn't have to be a machine learning model. It can be an algorithm. It can be, you know, a handwritten decision tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of instilling, I, I tend to sound like a broken record, you know, <laughs> like around the office. So I'm always like, do you, you know, do you trust the data? You know, that, that's the number one thing. And there's a lot of packed into that statement. Yeah. Um, trust in the data means like you, whatever you build, the model's going to 
the model comes from that data, right? You're, you're modeling that. I mean, you're trying to um, re represent the data or, I mean, you're not reproducing data, but like you're, you're, um, you're building a model on that data set. And so if you don't trust the data or if it's a, if it's a biased sample, right? Why would like you, you, like, you wouldn't feel comfortable applying it outside of scope, right? The challenge is the holy grail or like when I found machine learning to be very powerful is when it generalizes outside of your data set. Right. Yeah. So I've, I built models where like, you know, maybe like as an example, you know, let's say build a model on invoices in um, Great Britain. And then I'm not sure if it's going to work, uh, let's say for, uh, I don't know, like Singaporean documents that are also in English. Right. But mm -hmm. if it works, you know, maybe the accuracy is not as high, but I feel like, oh, that's a really cool thing because it does generalize. Right. It, it's generalized. The accuracy is not that great. But ultimately, you know, so, so it's like you want to be able to build models that generalize outside of scope but then you also want your data set to reproduce it's almost like a catch twenty, right you want your data to be a holistic view so like ideally you would train on data that you um that, that you you know for your universe that you're interested in um but yeah so so it it, it is a challenge of, of trying to kind of you know balance those two um those two areas right you want to be able to generalize but you also want to have a, a model that yeah. is unbiased i think right Right. So like, you know, let me paraphrase a little bit here. So if you're working with your team and they're building a model um, that's in, where the training data set is, um, you know, set of images from uh, of, of invoices, you know, based in the UK, uh, you might ask them like, hey, like, I think we might be expanding beyond just the UK. The UK is just like our, our first project. And I do want you to think a little bit more um, you know, make this model ideally a little, little bit more generic. I know, I know we don't have the data set maybe for other areas, but like, just think about it in, in, in a more, you know, generic way and, and try not to cut corners, you know, um, and, and make it so specific to what you see in the UK. So that's kind of like, yeah. you know, there's that balance there. You don't want to make it so general that like, you know, you're, you're ready for documents in all sorts of different languages other than outside of English and, and that, you know, the scope creep can, can be get, get quite, you know, crazy at that point. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think that balance is what I think you're, you're pointing to is, is one of your roles as, as, as a DSL is, is to, you know, help your data scientist thinks and, and think in those terms. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of like committees, like I, I try not to, like, I really want, like, there's a book on extreme ownership that, that is around the office. Um, I forget, I think the author is like a couple of Navy SEALs or something, but the, uh -huh. the point is that like, if, if you're building it, you should own it. Right. Um, you can't just depend on a committee to approve, right? sure, even sure. if it's a sensitive thing. I mean, like hypothetically, that's you're at a bank and you're building models for credit lending, right? Or credit decisioning or loans. Um, if in your task to build a machine learning model for that, you need to, you know, essentially own that whole piece so that, uh, if, and when it gets deployed, that you trust the results, you have to verify, you have to test it in all those extreme cases. And. Um, and you know, it's not, you know, at build.com, like we're in FinTech. So anything finance related is heavily regulated. Right. right. So there's a lot of testing. We, we go through tons and tons of testing, but at the end of the day, it falls down to the engineer or the researcher that built the model. It's, it's, you know, if something doesn't work, it's on them to, to, you know, resolve it, to fix it, figure out why and yeah, move on. Right. And when you say testing, are you talking about like, um, testing the accuracy of the model, like throwing, you know, different test data sets to the model. Are you also talking about like once the model's deployed, making sure it gets, it's tested and it's, it, it is, you know, operating within whatever SLAs you have and that kind of thing, or probably both. Yeah, both, definitely both. Yeah. Um, okay. and, and testing as well. If it's, uh, if it's related to bias in the marketplace, we, we need to cover the, you know, you see it in the news all the time. Right. Um, I mean, Apple's, uh, I think the, uh, one of their card credit cards as well, like had different limits for the different spouses in a household. You know, the, these types of things, um, you know, I, I hate to see it because I'm, you know, I, I'm fairly optimistic. Like, I feel like the people that released it had the best intentions in mind. Sure. Maybe it just wasn't um, tested enough. In fintech, every, you know, you have to cover your bases. And then absolutely when it's in production, you know, there's the um, a common ph phenomenon of just decay, right? So your model sure. looks really good, you know, Daisy or maybe the first week. But every model, I'll say every model, I still have some models that are deployed that are like a year old or more, but but a lot of models do decay over time because of the time dependence, right? So you have to monitor, you have to monitor um, once it's released, you know, there's a whole life cycle of, 
of machine learning, right? It's like sure. you, once you release it, you're not done yet. You know, you still have to monitor. Yeah. You have to make yeah. sure it still works. Uh, the SLA is incredibly important if it's real time predictions. Um, if you're in the cloud, for example, um, there's there's SLA. Yeah, so so there's a lot of like you know, there, there's a whole life cycle. Yeah, it's very yeah. interesting. I, I do want to get to, to deep learning, but I'm just fascinated. You, know, you, you mentioned that you, you've spoken in the past about bias, right? And that bias clearly in fintech is 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 one of the big challenges. Like, what are what are some what what is some advice that you would give like other DSLs yeah. who might be in a regulated industry and, and from just at a high level in yeah. terms of you know trying to to limit, reduce, get rid of to what extent possible bias yeah. Um, yeah. in our models. Um, I, I, and they probably already know this. Um, the more interpretable the model, I think the better. Mm -hmm. um, and even going all the way to just not even doing machine learning, um, have an algorithm, have an algorithm for your credit decisioning or for your fraud detection or um, whatever, you know, what, whatever you, you know, if, if your um, group is risk averse in this regard, you know, like tech companies, they want to move, not all, not all of them, like we don't, but like a lot of tech companies want to move fast and break things, even in fintech, right? Um, they, they find that that's their uh, ultimate passion, right? That they just want to really move, move fast. But I would say that if you're not comfortable with moving fast, you know, start with an algorithm that you can see that you know the limits of, right? It's, it's just a, it's a formula. Um, move from there to completely interpretable models. Those are uh, linear models or decision tree type models. So you can still build that off data, but you get an artifact that you can see, you can understand, oh, this is the decision. This is why you know, this mm -hmm. applicant was accepted, you can see kind of the, the logic that, that the tree went down. Once you get into nonlinear models, um, you know, there, there are, and I know banks, um, you know, we're not a bank, but I, I've worked with banks in the past. So I know banks use things like um, explainability. I've, I've actually given talks on explainability. So trying to understand uh, nonlinear models and what they'll call black box models. It's, it's, yep. it's just a nonlinear model. Um, it has a curvature, right? So you so you can find a local area of that model that you can fully exp I mean fully explain. It's an approximation, but it becomes a lin it becomes linear because you're you've zoomed into that local area. Um, I mean, it's you know it, it depends how risk averse you are um, it, and your group and what their what the goals are, right? Um, but but I, I, I imagine a lot of people kind of think that as well. Like if they're in these heavily regulated industries, right, where they're applying machine learning, right. I mean, that's a good segue, I think, into, you know, getting started with deep learning. I think one of the, the at least what I've heard is that, you know, the, one of the challenges of deep learning is that black box sort of um, <laughs> moniker that it that it's given. So I don't know, maybe, you know, segue into, into deep yeah. learning and, and talk a little bit more about like getting started there and what are some of the, I don't know, what are some of the traps you got to be aware of? What are some, some, some ways in which to, sure. in, to get started? Sure. There's so much, um, there's so much online actually. I've, I've, um, the way that I got into deep learning is I was doing machine learning and I was, um, you know, reading, watching as much stuff. Like there's uh, master classes. I think Stanford has ma um, their master level classes on YouTube. But um, one thing I noticed, you know, coming from physics is how actually accessible deep learning feels. You know, in physics, if you have a lab, you know, I was an experimentalist. You know the equipment costs are in right. like the million or above a million. <laughs> if you're doing you know big big experiments, it's in the billions, obviously. But you know, forget that. Yeah, there's like not in open a lab, source lasers and things like that that you can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, linear accelerators I, I, or whatever the heck they're called. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't have that. You know, here. You know, <laughs> right. in my condo. But yeah. but deep learning, like as an example, you know, I have a GPU machine. Um, you know, I, I threw Linux on it, and I was I'm able to train at night. Like it's um, in some ways it's it's. It, from a science, per, if you come from an academic science perspective, it feels very approachable um, uh, in terms of the hardware, right? Um, and then what what you can do is I, I you know do a side pro do a personal project if it's something you're interested, something you're passionate about learning. Um, ultimately, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So if you know machine, I, I would start with machine. If you don't know either, start with right. machine learning. You you can train that on your laptop, probably even on your phone these days, or yeah. your iPad if you have some data. Um, start with there. You know, learn kind of the statistics or the math that's involved with with some of the modeling, the testing. You know, um, black box to me. I mean, random forest is a black box. Uh, XGBoost is a black box. Deep, lear uh, a deep learning model is a bigger model, right? It, it, it's um, sometimes a slower model. So it might take on my laptop a second to score 
Whereas, you know, a random forest might take like, you know, a 10th of a second. So that makes it a little bit harder to work with, but you can apply similar techniques. So you can apply the same kind of explainability techniques to it. But in, 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 you know, when you're picking a personal project, I think, um, you know, we talked about some of the domains that deep learning has been very powerful in. So like video, uh, mm -hmm. uh, photos or uh, images, um, audio, text or language processing. Um, there's a lot of open data. So ImageNet for images, I think there's like 100 million images. Uh, for text, there's Wiki, uh, Wikipedia, I mean, um, you know, the Corpus, there's I think even Yelp comments. Uh, there might be some other open data sets. Uh, you'll notice the size of the data sets and it's critical because, uh, you know, mentioning deep learning models, they're big. And so mm -hmm. to train them, you need a lot of data. You, you absolutely, you, you can't train it from scratch on a small amount of data, but there's techniques like transfer learning so with transfer learning, you take a pre-trained model and you fine tune it just a little bit um, on your kind of maybe smaller data set. You can run it on GPU you know, overnight, get some results the next morning. That was, you know, <laughs> that's stuff that I'm, that I'm excited about doing, but um, yeah. I, you know, whatever, like whatever um, uh, project you might be passionate about or domain you might be passionate about. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about deep learning or machine learning, just, just go and, and, and just, you know, if, if you can only do it as a side project, you know, not like at build.com, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, brag, but like, we're very open to doing machine learning, but I know like there are, you know, some air, some um, companies out there that aren't so open. And if you're starting out, if you're, you know, kind of starting in the field, you may not have the opportunity to do it um, in your, in your current position, if you're like a software engineer or, or a data analyst, but, but don't let that stop you, you know, uh, in some ways, like, if if I could do it, you know, like on a laptop, oh, I I, I think most people can do it, you know. Let's yeah. just say, yeah. So, yeah, my 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 teenage son is trying to convince me that that he needs to to buy a uh, like a he wants to get like a, a a machine like a like a PC type machine and buy a GPU card because he wants to mine Bitcoin. So um, oh, maybe okay. I can convince him instead. <laughs> To use that GPU uh, to to actually yeah to to do, like build a lead deep learning model, I think that might be better for his his long term uh, term career. <laughs> well, um, depends on the coin. Like if it's Dogecoin, maybe <laughs> it's, exactly. It's been pretty uh, doing pretty well. No, I, I agree. I mean, like to be honest, you know, when I was getting the machine, it wasn't just for deep learning. Like I, I like playing video sure. games, and yeah, I've, yeah. I mean, I've I've had Nvidia cards since like I was I don't know like fourteen or something, and this yeah. is way before any of this, right? Um, and, and, but it's just, it, it's just a passion, right? Like it's, it's cool to be able to train stuff overnight, you know, spin it up, kind of dig into CUDA, you know, dig into TensorFlow, you know, when you're in the cloud, every, it's so nice. And in, in the cloud, right. everything is there. It's everything's prepackaged when you have your own Linux machine and then you have to debug, oh, why did my, uh, you know, audio drivers cut out? <laughs> why did my GPU, like, why is it not spin? You know, I can't see it. Like. I mean, I can see it, but I can't see it in the terminal. So it's like, yeah. you know, there's, there's a sort of like tinkering. It's kind of cool. I mean, I, I, I like that kind of like digging into to that level um, because you, you, maybe you'll miss some of that if you're just always in the cloud and, and everything looks great. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I, I know um, dealing with sort of GPU drivers and, 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 and can be a, a real hassle. Um, so, you know, the advent of the cloud and having, you know, uh, whether it be Docker images or what have you that are already ready to go, um, it just makes life so much, you know, so much simpler. So, um, so, so the, I mean, that segues into a conversation about the cloud. So, you know, what we, you know, what I've heard so far is like, Hey, if you want to get involved in deep learning, obviously you should have some background in, in machine learning, um, you know, find a, a, a use case. I mean, was there a specific use case that you like started with like a sort of a hello world of, of like a, of, of deep learning? Was it some like image classifier or something like that? Do you recall? Okay. I'm trying to remember. I I think actually it was um like a like a stock um predictor. So like trying to use LSTMs, and I bought some you know uh, stock data like for the U.S. markets. It was very. Right. It was like maybe in the tens of dollars. Um, I think that was one of the first ones I attempted. Um, I'm trying to. Remember. I I have played around with imaging it, but I think actually within within the roles that I've been in, um, and then obviously in the pre-trained mo you know pre-trained models are so powerful. You know, because you can just then fine tune and and you don't need actually don't need that much data, but right, right, right. Um, so I think what I'm also hearing is that I need to come to you for stock advice as well. Um, <laughs> it's probably I'm sure you uh, you're in version 27 uh, of that model. Uh, this is not financial advice. I'm not yeah, running any. That's models. not that's what this podcast <laughs> is all about. 
Um, but yeah, you could kill, kill two birds with one stone on that one. Um, so at any rate, so, you know, start with something basically, you know, fairly simple out there. I'm sure there are, there are places to go, um, to learn more, but obviously the advent of the, of the cloud has been very helpful. Um, not everyone, you know, is going to, um, buy a machine with a NVIDIA, you know, GPU. Um, and I don't know, maybe yeah. you can help us too. Like why are GPUs, um, so helpful? I mean, do you know why they're so helpful when it comes to deep learning, help demystify that for our, for our audience here? Yeah, um, I, I, that's a good question. I think that's related to the parallelization um, of the, what are they called? Uh, the, there's, a, there's a core in a GPU process. I, I, should, have, I should have studied this. So you studied it, yeah. Yeah, you have, you have to prep for the, um, the DSL podcast. I ask, you t I ask tough questions on the podcast. <laughs> there's, it's a good, there's a good distinction compared to a, a GPU compared to a CPU. Um, yeah. There's a notion of these these core. I forget the name of the core, but it's highly parallelizable, and it, the way that it does math for constructing, I guess, a 3D scene, is um, there's a lot of like you know corollary to the math involved with all the matrix, you know, the matrix math within um, doing your you know um, forward pass, you know, backward pass to calculate to compute the gradient descent, mm -hmm. make the updates, you know, get your next mini batch forward pass, backward pass. There's a lot of parallelization within, um, uh, you know, within those steps. So right. I, I think that's why, and, and uh, T, uh, TPUs are the ones that uh, Google are working on. I'm less, even less familiar with. There's more specialized hardware, but I will say this for the cloud in general. Um, you know, this is like, this is a hobby, you know, what I, I, I guess you can see, it, but like my desktop is a hobby. When you're talking right. about, you know, building something that, you know, millions of people are gonna use at scale, you know, at any times of the night, um, you know, being able to spin up, spin down instances, um, monitor, you know, logging, um, um, fail safe, like SLAs, you know, being able to revert things that that's just the life cycle. That's the part of the model where it's running. And then there's all the training. So when you have a team, um, like we have a team that are using, um, you know, GPU resources and you have a fixed number of GPUs, let's say in a closet somewhere there's going to be a queue building of jobs yeah. to send. Oh, yeah. Actually, yeah. like like many years ago, this was this was how we were doing things. This was actually um, in an academic lab. And um, there's someone that I'm sure this person now is like, you know, the head of AWS or something. But at the time, they're maintaining, <laughs> you know, a closet full of hardware for a bunch of scientists. And you would send jobs and send and it's a limited amount. Um, yeah, obviously, to purchase more, you have to wait and it takes time. You have to plan for it. You know, in the cloud, like if, if one day I need a hundred GPUs for something, I can do that. Right. Or maybe right. I need one or if yeah. I'm running in production. Yeah. Like some, like there's a big spike all of a sudden. We don't know. We don't understand why a lot of requests they can, you know, they manage that. They manage the, the, um, you know, the kind of that load balance. So it's pretty, pretty incredible just how easy it is these days yeah. to, to do but, some of these But models. with that ease, I, I mean, I know, I mean, let's talk a little bit about some of the, maybe the challenges that you faced. I mean, it's, it's, it's not cheap either, right? I mean, is that, I mean, I'm, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, exactly. That, that's the downside. The downside is it is more expensive in some ways. Um, maybe that's a good thing. So if people are using it, if you see users enjoy it because either they're getting results faster, more accurately, um, results that you couldn't get with a, you know, with a classical ML model. Um, and then they're using, so if they're using it, you have to purchase, you know, the hardware to, to show, you know, to represent that. But maybe that's a good thing because you're, you have users that are enjoying the experience. Um, that that's absolutely true. So in terms of the cost, but there, there are ways like, um, you know, with AWS, they have like spot instances. And then the other thing, and, and we go back to uh, regulations, I know like some banks and they're pretty open about it. Um, they do everything on-prem. They're not comfortable yet. Some of the mm -hmm. biggest banks in, in the world um, are still on-prem. Uh, I think eventually they'll probably migrate, you know, to whichever cloud they feel comfortable with. Um, but but today they're not, right? So, so it's still, I think it, it's a journey for a lot of different kind of established entities out there. Yeah. Are there any other, um, you know, pieces of advice or, or things that, you know, things to sort of be aware of uh, when starting your journey in, in deep learning? But obviously, I think, you know, start with, you know, start with learning. S step two is you know, about deep learning. And then step two was really, you know, uncover a, a valid sort of use case that, that sort of makes sense. I mean, you don't want to be throwing deep learning as a solution to every um, type of use case. I mean, you mentioned a few in terms of, you know, video, photo, you know, text classifiers, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I mean, 
I don't know. Was there any like did did a member of your team like spin up a, a GPU machine and 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 use a you know a deep learning type model for some, for a use case that wasn't <laughs> remotely appropriate but just <laughs> for fun or something? Racked up a huge bill. Like, anything to be aware of? Um, I don't know. Like I mean, it, ha- it doesn't happen too often, but I understand the sentiment. Yeah, I think I um you know we have really we have a really strong team and and they use you know I always say like they use the right tool for the job and that's really great to see. Yeah. But I, but I, I get the sentiment of wanting to try something new. Um, there, by the way, you can train in neural nets in Scikit. Um, there are feed forward networks in Scikit. Now you won't get the fancy, I think, convolutional nets, and you won't get the you can't run on GPU, but it will train on your CPU. Um, mm-hmm. But but I will say that you know um, you know don't don't let any like all the domains I mentioned. I'm sure I missed some domains. So sure, someone's going to come sure. back. Well, you can yeah. do it on DNA analysis. You, know, you can do it yeah, on, yeah, on yeah, genomics. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally. like, yeah, actually, totally. you could. <laughs> yeah. Or you can do it for for Go. You know, for video games. Like, yeah, actually, there there are other domains that I didn't mention. Um, mm-hmm. But but you have to, I guess, do the literature search. You know, it goes back to like kind of the PhD training. Um, what it trains you is to do the literature search. So you're interested. You know, step one, find something you're interested in. Right? It's always like right. <laughs> sometimes it's lost, but but it's so yeah. critical. It's like, what are you interested in um, solving? Does it you know it starts to look up what people have done in that field, um, what they've what they what the challenges are today, right? Um, is it even a, an ML problem? Potentially, let's say it is an ML problem. It beca- is it a deep learning problem? Um, have people applied deep learning to it? Yeah. So you do that literature search, you go deeper and deeper into the, the actual research articles, like on archive or whatever, um, you know, uh, reading a bunch of blogs and things. And and I think then you start to craft maybe a problem, but you're, you know, you're passionate about the, the domain or, or the, the big kind of overarching problem. And now you're crafting maybe a problem that deep learning can be applied to because it's ultimately not magic, right? Um, you can you know, you're, we're not creating like sentient beings, <laughs> you know, you're solving <laughs> yet, a particular, anyway. yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. It, it, will, it will take some time, maybe Tesla's yeah. strong, but, but yeah. we'll take some time, right? It, it, um, we're, we're, it, it's solving a specific problem, but it can, but it, in some of these instances can solve it really well. And then, uh, because if you're interested in neural networks, you'll probably start to dig into all the different types of layers. You know, I mentioned convolutional, uh, convolutional nets, recurrent nets, uh, transformers, you know, capsules. There's like all, all sorts of many different ones in the literature. So if you're interested in these layers and you have a problem that you're interested in solving, like uh, what was a good one? I mean, even like, let, let's say you're trying to like, you know, you, let, let's say you have a new baby, you have a baby monitor and you're trying to analyze that video and make make a classifier of like, oh, my baby's up, you know, like like she stood up. So, so right, maybe she's right. ready to get, and you want to send a notification. That's a cool problem, you know, something you might be passionate about. Um, you know, get that video data, um, read the literature, figure out what pe- what kinds of models people have done. Um, you know, whether you run it in the cloud or or if you have hardware kind of you know on your desk, that 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 doesn't really matter too much. Um, mm-hmm. And then just start to experiment and see what see what you get. But you know, it's sol- like solving that problem. You're not gonna you know you, you don't have like a robot nanny, right? right? It's like it's solving a particular problem. So. So, so I think that's, you always have to frame these ML problems in that kind of, in that regard. hundred percent, hundred percent. I think that's a recurring theme of the DSL podcast is, is know the business problem start there um, <laughs> before you just start throwing code at it, throwing hardware at it, et cetera. Uh, well, cool. Let's, let's um, wrap up one, one final topic. I mean, you, you, um, we talked briefly of, about, you know, the fact that you have a physics background and you, you know, you clearly have been extremely successful in your career. Um, you know, despite having your, getting your PhD in, in physics, <laughs> uh, just, yeah, despite, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, but like, I'm curious, like, are there if, if you're struggling to to hire um, data scientists, um, like, I, I think one, you know, sort of um, fruitful ground uh, of, of, of 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 folks out there are there's some extremely smart people who are getting their PhDs in sort of you know, technical fields, um, and even, you know, psychology, I mean, you name it, like th- that have statistics yeah. sort of baked into them and it behooves you to take a chance on, on some of these folks. Like if you're looking, um, I mean, clearly somebody took a chance on you and, uh, and it's been paid off in spades. So, um, I, I assume you would agree. I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth. Yeah. I'm seeing you nod. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I agree completely. Um, you know, what, one thing I like about being in this area is, um, even just like the degree matters less. It, it does. Yeah. It, it matters less than maybe other areas in the world, like, I don't know, like 
it's like like me being a lawyer or something i don't know right, but right, right. but it does like um i've noticed that um it, it's not like you're it's not like the degree or like where you went to school and i like that i actually like that a lot because it matters more about like how you how you solve problems or how you look at a problem how you try to solve it there is a lot of untapped resources in the in the academic field but we'll see like because I, I mean, I have friends that are still. I mean, I you know went through school with them. Sure. They're still in the you know they're professors now, um, or researchers or scientists in in you know basic science. You know, not everyone wants to go and work for companies. You know, not everyone wants to um, move move kind of away from ac academia. And so I totally understand that. But there, yeah, I, I would say um, if you uh, if you have kind of an opportunity or um, I don't know, like, how would you say? So if you have um, like a connection with labs, I mean, we have a connection with Rice University um, mm -hmm. and also with um, with uh, SF State. So so if you have a connection and you start to talk with students, whether they're undergrads or grads and see what their interests are, you know, are they interested in, in, in for, for our group for machine learning, but maybe they're interested in, in computer science, maybe they're interested in mobile development, or maybe they're interested in, in a whole other different thing. But there are um, the, the the search, the searches um, um, for for uh, let's see. So so the search for I don't know where I was gonna go with this because like the search for you know strong candidates, you know you never know where they're gonna come from. I guess right. like you have like if you're searching, you have to really search everywhere. You have to go really deep and search because there could be strong candidates anywhere, even like you know obviously internationally. Um, and then in within the U.S., like it could be, you know, with the pandemic, you know, people are kind of hiring remotely, hiring everywhere. And so, um, yeah, so I wouldn't limit, obviously, yeah, don't don't limit to like one particular, you know, undergrad or one particular undergrad or major. major. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, you know, what what I found in, in working with with PhD grads is they have this um like you, you, they kind of have due to their role, like, like they're always learning. They're, they're loving to learn. And, and one thing we know about data scientists and the data science community is that like learning is part of the job because, because I think the, the pace of innovation is so quick and um, it is so easy these days with open source and, and now the cloud to be able to experiment, like experimentation has to be in your blood. Right. And um, if, and most, <laughs> most folks who come from, you know, uh, getting their PhD, right. That's, that's what they have, have been doing for, for many years. Right. Um, and yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, it, it to me, you know, it, it's fertile ground. It's, it's uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, take a chance. Uh, you're not always going to be able to hire you know, somebody with a PhD in stats or I don't know, but I don't even know if you can get a PhD in data science these days, but who knows, maybe you can. <laughs> They're starting um, now, but that's a really now, good point. Yeah. That, that's a good point. Cause like, you know, in a PhD environment, you're tackling one problem for multiple years. And so you're going to, you're going to hit your head against the wall. It's like, I know I did like yeah. for, you know, like a year, two years trying to, trying to understand that, that problem. Um, and so you, it, you do build that. It, it becomes a muscle of like, um, the experimentation of what you mentioned, like the experimentation and research side of things is critical uh, because you're trying different, you know, in, in, um, in machine learning and especially in deep learning now, you know, there's a lot of, um, th th there's a lot of like trial and error. And, and even when you read articles, you'll see, they sometimes con contradict each other, right? Like one article finds a particular architecture really good and another one doesn't. And then another one actually affirms the first one. And, Kind of, it's a like ping pong back and forth. In other words, no one really knows what's going on, and yeah. um, and then in academia, you know, you know, if you're a grad student, you're you're producing literature that's you know, in some cases, on the cutting edge of of your domain of what you're trying to study. Um, so there is no blueprint, right? Like there is no kind of right now. There's no right or wrong answer, and so you're trying to figure that out. So there, it is like it, you you do build that as a muscle, and, and that I have seen um, a PhD. Uh, 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 PhD people that, that have become um, or went into the machine learning um, world that they do have that um, capability and they, they they are successful because of that because they don't give up right I mean maybe that's like yeah. cliche yeah, yeah, or whatever yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but they don't you know, when, when something doesn't work like they just keep that going that dogged determination it, so. to, to, to finish <laughs> their thesis or you know to 
to build that to model that's better rich. than the last or whatever, whatever. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, exactly. uh, hey, Aton, this has been great. I've learned, I've learned a lot. I hope uh, our audience has as well. I really appreciate you, you taking the time. If people want to reach out to you, I, su- I assume they can reach out to you via LinkedIn. Is that, is that correct? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Find me on LinkedIn. Um, send me a message if you're curious about something or you want to chat, uh, have an opinion. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, well, Aton, um, thank you so much for joining the DSL podcast and uh, have a great rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Great. Thanks, Dave.